myself. So please give a warm welcome to Ross Hamilton. Thank you. There's probably about 45 slides here, so we're going to try to go through about one every 1.5 minutes, if possible, and try to keep up with the pace. A Manitou may be thought of as a potent spirit that has taken residence in something other than an animal, perhaps a tree, a rock, a mound, a true genius loci of a sacred site. In terms of the spiritual science of old, and I'm an initiate of, a, of an Indian master, an East Indian master, uh, a Manitou may be a creature such as a dragon born of the arts of architecture and geomancy that draws to itself and concentrates a largesse of earth energy in order to effect some profound harmony between earth and sky. In different parts of the world, large-scale effigies, gargantuan plinth structures, and cyclopean platforms carved directly from the natural outcroppings of stone are held to have underscored the functionability of these titan intercessors between heaven and earth. But we misplace the consciousness necessary to recognize these remotely antique pedestal forms and why our destiny is to rediscover them and begin to steward the earth as our forebears did competently and well. It is a tradition that Atlantis, with its many island and country, had succeeded in etherealizing a good portion of this lowest dimension of our planet at one point in its history, as did also Lemuria known to the sages of India as Akesh, this crucial element of life, which is we call ether or aether, was once constantly distilled out of the twin forms of energy arising from the aura of Gaia, from within her and above her, her magnetic field. Okay, slide two then, you know. When the first pioneers crossed over the Allegheny Mountains, they found 10,000 works of earth and stone. And I know some of you out there in the audience have been here, so you know what I'm talking about. I think Andrew Collins has been here, and I think he's speaking it for me. Most of these burial mounds um, contained uh, bones and artifacts, but some of them did not. And these are the ones that we're going to focus on today. There's probably 50 or 60 temple-like structures that were very large that uh, contained no burials within the walls of the structures themselves. Um, these were the remains of the Manitous and temple or lodge foundations from a previous age, remains of a golden era of architecture and geomancy that had apparently been refurbished by native people beginning around 400 BCE. And I promised Hugh that I would be able to announce the new carbon dating for Serpent Mound. This is a big deal here in the Ohio Valley. And when you're talking in Gobekli Tepe or something like that, it, it, it doesn't seem very old, but I'll explain to you why it's so important that the Serpent was originally um, constructed, not designed, but reconstructed about uh, 300 years before the Common Era between three or 400 years. Um, using the tools of archaeoastronomy, we estimate to me the original constructs of these Manitous and temple foundations go back to between five and 6,000 years, when an enlightened race of extraordinary physical stature and ability worked unceasingly as true stewards of the earth. And what this means is they use these, as John Michel said, they use these structures, which we only have the foundation for now, as instruments of a spiritual science by which they distilled the twin elements of the magnetic field as they're brought into our, our world, the positive and the negative charges, negative being the sky, positive being the earth. And they did this by 
invoking or evoking the uh, powers of heaven to concentrate and flow into these manitous and convert the twin energies of earth and sky into a new kind of energy, which is actually a kind of a literal um, translation of the ether, the elusive ether of physics and metaphysics into our world. And so as John Michel has, has explained to us, uh, the geometries that they use to construct these manitous and these temples as well as the substances that they used had to be of the highest quality. So they really worked on their geometrics and their, their measurements and so forth. And they really worked on the, on, the, on the metals and the crystalline substances that they worked into their architectures. So these twin expressions of nature would come together, they would alchemize onto the salt of these structures from the sulfur and mercury of their alchemy, the sky and the earth energies, uh, into the best possible energy uh, available. So um, we estimate that the serpent mound was the central part of their cosmography. And uh, although we covered much of the serpent mound, the Glastonbury in America, um, uh, we're only going to be able to move on from that point today. Um, while fading away, the memory of these people yet saw practicality in the idea of preserving these millennia old architectural foundation traces. So we're indebted to the Adena people and the Hopewell people. Now, archaeologists today think that they designed these earthworks, but they're at a loss to explain how they had this advanced geometrical and astronomical knowledge, because their grave evidence shows that they were very primitive. Um, Native American uh, writers and um, uh, holy men say that uh, their people reconvened these ancient sites. And we believe that they were revived from a culture that moved into the Americas from the Atlantic Basin sometime beginning around 12,000 years ago when the Atlantic Basin flooded. Now what's interesting about this is that uh, Atlantis and Lemuria, according to uh, our best theosophical and philosophical traditions, were able to literally invoke so much of this uh, energy and utilize the magnetic energies of the earth and sky that they control earthquakes by, by pulling the electrical force out of the earth before it turned into heat energy, which is, of course, what's causing many of the earthquakes today. Overexpansion of the Earth's crust has created a terrible um, uh, expansion, and so we have an increasing number of earthquakes. Um, and in those days, they were able to keep the earthquakes fairly well at bay and to hold back volcanic eruptions through many centuries of pulling the energy out of the Earth as the Earth moved through its own magnetic field, and then pulling the energy out of the sky, which also uh, utilized the magnetic energy, uh, converted it into a negative force, and combining those two forces very cleverly into an energy that literally transmuted their original structures into ethereal structures, so that when Atlantis fell, um, many of those structures were raised up to a completely etheric plane, leaving only the foundation traces. And many of those islands, of course, were submerged under the melting glacial uh, outwash. So when we found these structures in the Ohio Valley, and we found other colonies of Atlantis, like in Egypt, in, in Glastonbury, uh, in Greece, in Guatemala, etc., cetera, uh, we, we realized that the native people, the indigenous people, under inspiration or instruction had sort of reconvened many of these post-Atlantean colonies so that they were temporarily reactivated about 6,000 years ago. So about 5,000 years ago, they, they again were diminished. And the crystals and the, uh, the, the highly organized materials that were used to make our manitous uh, were removed and placed in repositories. So you want to move on to the next? 
number three there. Okay, to give you some idea of the timeline that we're looking at, um, the picture on the right shows the uh, serpent mound. It's an accurate survey that was taken by a friend of mine, Bill Romain, uh, back in 1987. It's the first accurate map ever made of the serpent mound. And uh, we, uh, through trial and error in the beginning, outfitted it to the upper asterism of the constellation Draconis, caught between the Little and Big Dippers. And right at the middle, the bright white light there, with a little arrow pointing to it, that was the pole star, Draconis Alpha, um, 5,000 years ago. We've since drifted by precession to the end of the handle of a little dipper, which meets the outside of the circle. The inside of the circle being the last pole star, and the outside being the present pole star. So you can see that between the two pole stars, Apparently, these people planned for a possible understanding of what they had and sort of uh, psychically reminding us, if you will, that it's time to reconvene the sacred structures in order to um, save the earth, so to speak, from uh, a destiny of uh, fire and uh, brimstone in reality with earthquakes and the volcanics. And, um, when we sort of drop to this lower level of perception without the etherealized landscape, which Michelle uh, beautifully characterized as enchanting the landscape, when we fell to this level of consciousness, we also um, uh, le were left to our own devices and we separated into thousands of schools of thoughts, different religion, and so forth. And uh, as a result of that, um, we very quickly uh, developed uh, technologies that were not in harmony with one another. And so um, money became the prime focus. But that's all about to change. On the left picture, you'll see um, the focus of their extreme north cosmology. And uh, the Little Dipper was uh, inhabited by two structures. One of them, the Glenford Fort, which is about 30 acres, is pointing to the last pole star. And uh, you can also see Cepheus, which is a, 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 an avatar of a large turtle. And then uh, Mound City with its two parts off the uh, lower asterism of Draconis. Um, we're visited by Maya sometimes because I work at Serpent Mound. And three of our Mayan elders have said that the serpent is holding the ket in its jaws which is uh, a term they mean for the universal egg, the goose that laid the golden egg. And then we realized uh, that the serpent is just the flat uh, remnant of a platform upon which they created this beautiful manitou that processed in copious amounts the energies of heaven and earth. Okay, next slide. All right, th this gives you a pretty good idea of the area. On the right, again, uh, we see the area in dark green uh, and light green are the five states that, in, or four states, excuse me, that inhabit the Ohio Valley. And in, in the dark green in the center of the light green patch is the area that these temple structures are spread out in. So you can see that in comparison to Glastonbury, their design idea was slightly different. And as Michelle points out, there are many astrological slash astronomical schemes all over the planet in those days. And I think that the artists in those times uh, enjoyed kind of um, competing with each other on how to, um, how to reproduce heaven on earth. On the right, you see a, a, a further outlay of uh, some of these structures. Um, so instead of trying to mirror the sky dome like at Glastonbury, I think what they were trying to do was just represent all the constellations they could, but they made each one a special sanctuary, and so they constructed it, not in the order it was in the sky, but on various rivers and on high ground where they could contact lightning strikes and convert energy on their own to complement the central Manitou of Serpent Mount. Okay, the next slide. This is... Um, um, 
a paraphrase of John Michel, who is one of my heroes, by the way, and I'm sorry, I, I got to, uh, I, I didn't get to hear Christine's um, talk this morning or, or yesterday because uh, the Skype, or not the Skype, but the, uh, the system was down because of sunspots. But uh, um, essentially what he said was that these schemes had one thing in common, and that was they had a central mound structure or tor or mountain, and that established them as the axis mundi of their cosmos. And on the right, you can see the serpent mound, um, and I took the liberty of putting the sun disk back in its mouth, and around it are the 12 houses of our zodiac in the, in the uh, Ohio Valley. And if you look at each one, uh, you'll note that, um, if, especially if you've visited here, that they are very, very large structures. Now, Hugh can tell you that if you look to the top of, uh, of those 12 surrounding the serpent and go slightly to the right, that one alone is so large that you could probably fit about 18 soccer fields into it going stem to stern. It's called Fort Ancient and it houses the entire constellation of Scorpius. And then following, in, after that, you have Sagittarius, and then uh, Capricornus, and then um, uh, uh, Aquarius, Pisces, down at the base is Aries, and then Taurus moving up and so forth. And we'll cover some of those as we move along. Uh, next slide, please. This one, um, I just created for this presentation, and it struck me that the Glastonbury tour, which picture I stole off the internet, and I don't, I couldn't find an attribution for it. So, my apologies if the author is in the audience. Um, and at the top, of course, is the uh, is, is an old church remnant, and you can see very clearly, and I'm sure all of you are aware, which we here in Ohio aren't that aware because we're sort of uh, localized with our thinking apparatus. Uh, obviously the tour had been terraformed at one point in prehistory and uh, it's, it was beautifully done, it kind of like a, a, a whale, but it has several uh, levels of, uh, of platforms. And then on the right you can see the serpent mound um, constructed on its uh, sort of uh, platform, which in this case, case happens to be a natural um, uh, piece of uh, that is large, it's probably 30 acres, and uh, it has a channel of water that comes out on both sides, so that we think it also was terraformed at this point in time. Now, those of you from the 60s right, remember, might remember uh, Donovan's uh, talk about Atlantis way down below the ocean, where I want to be. And we, he talks about 12 ships that went out from Atlantis and these 12 ships had 12 gods on them, and they created colonies. And then John Michel informs us that each of these 12 colonies uh, terraformed the land and made the land worthy of creating these astrological, astronomical uh, cities or um, communities. Um, e each one was capable, and I think the tour at one time probably drew down so much energy from the sky that we cannot calculate it even in gigawatts on a yearly basis. And the serpent also, I believe, was producing a tremendous confariation, which means marriage, by the way, of energies from earth and sky, converting it into this etheric essence and transforming the landscape into a very fertile community, which we think was a, an earlier version of Eden or actually Eden. Uh, similarly, I think Glastonbury uh, Tour was the center of a, a all around the plain of a of a large complex, which when it was built up, was able to transmute enough energy from Earth and sky to literally bring to life a lost segment of Atlantis, which is probably still there today, but because many of those temple foundations were literally lifted up to the etheric level, we can't see them right now. With the reactivation of Glastonbury Tor and the Serpent Mound, which I believe will happen not in the not too distant future, um, we should gradually be able to dispel the shadows of, uh, of misperception of darkness 
that cloud our interior vision so that these um, uh, Manitous or temple structures or astrological houses, little towns and so forth, will again become visible to our eyes. But we're warned that before this can happen, before the tour and the serpent can be reactivated, that um, a lot of more people are going to have to be uh, educated to understand how this process can occur. Underneath the Glasnevin tour, I am informed through philosophical channels, as well as beneath the uh, serpent mound within its structure, likely exist uh, repositories wherein are placed many of the accoutrements and much of the hardware that's necessary to reconstruct some of the vital um, statues or manitous necessary to be able to um, convert the energies of earth and sky. It's not something that we can do um, by our own karmic uh, law, I guess you would say. We have to revisit um, the knowledge of our ancestors, and in order to do that, we have to follow a certain code. This is my understanding. It may not be everyone in the audience. Um, next slide. Okay. Um, in the middle picture there is a structure. This is a LIDAR segment. LIDAR is uh, light uh, infrared technology that bounces down an infrared beam of the Earth. And then when you model it afterwards, you can remove all of the, uh, all of the trees and out structures. And what you're seeing in the middle is a huge megalithic platform that rises right out of a valley several hundred feet. And it, you know, the Glastonbury Tor is pretty high. I mean, it looks like it's several uh, hundred yards or several hundred feet at least. But this one is really gigantic. The flat area you see there, which is modeled after the Manitou of a rabbit or a hare, the flat area is 48 acres. And this structure exists about eight miles directly north of Serpent Mound. So it's a little bit larger than Serpent Mound. And we think it represents not just the constellation of Lupus, but also um, the, uh, the planet Mercury because of its proximity to the, to the solar uh, Manitou of the Serpent. Now, we think the Fort Hill is sacred to Mercury, to Hermes, and that um, he once embodied as the greatest medicine man that ever lived, according to Native traditions. And they called himself Mikabo, the great hare. And he apparently knew the ways of the medicine so that he could extend his life expectancy to a thousand years, and that he was a god among his people, and he grew to be very, very tall and was robust in physical stature. Okay, next slide. Probably about 30 or 40 miles to the west of that one is another plinth structure, which is, again, several hundred feet. And you can see that it's uh, sacred to the constellation Aries. And its uh, structure is raised up and you can only enter into it by the north, which is at the left. If you uh, observe it carefully, you can see that it's in the shape of a giant boar and that this giant boar was made in the shape of that Manitou to represent the constellation Aries. Now there's an old Indian story that goes with it. On the, on the hindquarters of the great boar, there's a structure which is illustrated more in the upper right and that structure perfectly houses the seven stars of the Pleiades. And we think this is a marker along the plane of the ecliptic, the whole thing, telling us that in order to enter into Aries, which is the great boar, you have to pass through or by the Pleiades. And that structure that the Pleiades are housed in is a wonderful maze that anyone that tried to walk into it could easily um, be stopped by anyone who was to defend it. And uh, that whole thing is about 16 acres. And the lower right is, a, is the actual planning. Um, the next slide. Okay, this is the one that, uh, that is familiar with. Uh, 
This is for ancient, again, this LIDAR, which is done by a friend of ours, Jeff Wilson. Um, I can't even begin to tell you how large Fort Ancient is, but it wasn't until we found it correlated rather exactingly with the constellation Scorpius, especially adding the plane of the ecliptic for, um, for um, reference, that we realized these people or someone many thousands of years ago terraformed the whole area. Now, Michelle informs us as well as a fellow who I was under the pseudonym of Brother Philip, that um, the process of terraforming these megalithic platforms was done through using a primary source of energy gotten from the lodestone of all things, but that the knowledge of how to use the lodestone is still being withheld um, and is only uh, used in circles of initiates at this time, but that it will come back to uh, certain of, of the uh, old scientific community when it's time to reactivate these sites. Um, it's called Fort Ancient, and it was rehabilitated by the Adena and the Hopewell people beginning around uh, 2,500 years ago. And our science has no way of understanding how it was done. Next slide. This is a, a gigantic, um, it's a, it's a sort of uh, effigy to the constellation Sagittarius. And it's so large, it doesn't exist anymore because it was so large that the farmers just kind of leveled it. Uh, after the Revolutionary War, all these lands were given to the, uh, to the veterans of the Revolution and the Indians were chased out. The Indians preserved these sites for thousands of years, but the white man immediately uh, plowed them over, so only a few are left. The large circle is 1,800 feet across, and um, the use of circle square, smaller circle, has been a puzzle to archaeologists uh, because the, uh, the geometrics are, are very much reminiscent of the advanced geometries that were introduced by the Greeks in the first millennium, And since the people that reconstructed them lived about the same time, as Pythagoras and Archimedes and so forth, um, no, nobody has been able to understand how they could have done it because Native American tradition does not uh, support their knowledge of, um, of geometrics and astronomy. So that was another clue that the Indians necessarily, um, and out of the goodness of their own hearts, uh, reconstructed many of the outlines. And what's interesting about these outlines is that my friend, um, who was introduced to you as Vine Deloria by you, um, who has passed away now, but Vine is a prolific uh, native author. He wrote God is Red and uh, Custer Died for Your Sins and things like that. And he said that when Indians get together and have one of their powwows, they can invoke enough of the spiritual life force energy that wherever the powwow was, nothing will grow there for many years afterwards. It's not that the earth is sterilized, it's just that it becomes so hallowed. It's like certain crop circles, you know, the real crop circles, when they leave, uh, nothing will grow there for some time or things grow in a different way. And the seeds are different that, of things that grow in those areas. So we think that the Indians found these places bare and that their predecessors, the native people who had inherited them from a godlike race that had preceded them, that constructed the original Manitous and temples, um, had uh, somehow um, uh, taken away many of their uh, uh, remnants, anything that was left as relics, and they were crushed up into medicine and used that way. Uh, long enough to reduce them to just bare spots. And so, again, beginning about 2,500 years ago, the Native people were inspired to outline these things. So we're very grateful to them, because what we're looking at are actual Atlantean designs. Is this, I mean, it, I would be laughed at uh, by some of the archaeologists, but it's funny that the original people, the white people that came into the Ohio Valley, um, stipulated that these were Atlantis designs. 
And so everybody thought, oh, these mounds were made by the Atlanteans. And then, of course, that was quickly uh, rubbed out by uh, the early archaeological tenants. Okay, and the next uh, slide, Hugh. Um, this is uh, just a taste of the advanced geometrics of the one I just showed you, which is called the Liberty Works. Um, if you turn it uh, to its right side in the middle of the upper uh, row, you can see how the circle and the square line up in a straight line. And then, um, although the, uh, it may be, uh, hopefully it's bright enough, uh, many of the axioms that were introduced uh, by Archimedes are present. A single circle uh, in the frame below it, the middle frame of the bottom row, a single circle the size of the original big circle touches perfectly the center of all three. And then if you square the circle in the last lower right and circle that square, that same circle creates a perfect Vesica Pisces and surrounds the small circle in the square. Okay, next. Uh, this is called the Works East, and it's sacred to the constellation Virgo. By the time uh, around 1825, I guess, it was already partially washed away, and the river had changed its course, not once, but twice. So we think that many millennia had passed since it had been reconstructed, but that the people came in and did their best to keep it fresh. And they followed its outlines to the edge of the cliff, and there they stopped. And this is the constellation Virgo. A lot of people thought it was the same as the Liberty, so they thought they were limited in their understanding. Actually, one was Sagittarius, one was Virgo. Okay, the next one. And this shows that same Virgo and the geometrics and how sophisticated they were. Again, if you put it on a grid, um, this is the upper left, then you grid it off, middle, upper, right, the middle, right, up, and then on the, left, on the extreme right of the, um, of the upper, you can see how a line coming from one of the lines separating the grid will go right down uh, the, uh, the connector between the square and the circle. But going to the lower left of the bottom row, you can see how a true vesica Pisces is created off the original circle if you take that circle and move it over to the center of the square. So they had an art of geometry which allowed them to focus on the stars and yet hold true to classical geometric form. In the last square on the right, on the bottom row, you can see that by taking the sacred cut off of the square of the large circle, when you take that sacred cut down, that's the phi ratio for those of you that don't know, it touches precisely into the center of the square before it meets the phi ratio at the base of the, of the large circle. Again, these are concepts which weren't even known until the Renaissance, when Fibonacci and the artists of that period began to um, rediscover them for us. So karmic law has us rediscovering things. Uh, the next one, the next uh, slide. This is um, the site now. And it's completely destroyed now, except for a large mound inside of a large circle. And it's so big, you can't see the whole thing. Probably covers about 90 acres. And it, it seems to hold um, the constellation Andromeda with Triangulum and a couple of other parts of, of Pisces and so forth uh, very nicely. Okay, next slide. This shows the site complex that um, um, allows us to understand that the principles of the site complex uh, reflect um, Archimedean, the Archimedean principle of the Arbalos, which I explain in my book, Star Mounds, to some extent. It shows how the large circle is site and the uh, site square circled and so forth all conform to this wonderful formula of three circles contained within a larger circle. The red circle divided into the black circle is the phi ratio, 
And the black circle divided into the circle that encompasses the red and the black is also 1.618. So you have this wonderful nesting of the golden ratio that goes on ad infinitum. And this was a, a discovery that was introduced by um, Archimedes, but I happened to um, perfect it by just fooling around with the circles and found that you can have this perfect phi ratio. And this was how many of these earthworks were designed using a perfect and complete knowledge of phi. Okay, next. Okay, this is um, the great earthwork called um, Circleville. And what's beautiful about Circleville is that we think it was made in the effigy of an owl, a great owl effigy, and it holds very true to the constellation Pegasus. So that many of, of these, uh, and this is an interesting point to get a hold of, many of these designs um, conform almost exactly to the same constellations that we have today. And although it isn't true for the majority of them, many of them are very much or the same as our current. And I think that's because they enjoyed the same segmentation of the lane of the ecliptic, um, which gave them the same basic stars for their zodiacal houses. And when they work back from between the pole star and the zodiacal ecliptic, they were able to segment the, the north and south polar regions very similarly to what we have today. Okay, this one, um, the circle alone, the large circle, was about 1,500 feet across. And we think it was one of their medicine lodges. Okay, next. Uh, this is um, a large group uh, called the uh, Junction Group. And uh, it's also very large. It's probably on about... 25 to 28 acres, and it was constructed precisely to draw down from heaven and invite the constellation Capricornus, as you can see. And all these illustrations are in my book, Star Mounds. They're larger, so you can see them. Um, also, if anybody wishes to contact me, I can send you larger versions of these illustrations by email. It's my pleasure to do it. Okay, next. Okay, uh, Gemini. This is uh, right along the plane of the ecliptic, one of the 12 houses of the zodiac, surrounding the serpent mound. And it, every star, every major star in Gemini is held at some point by this weird structure that everyone has always wondered, what the heck is it? <laughs> if you turn it to its left, it looks like a, an oil lamp with a menorah contained in it. And so, some people speculated it was made by Jewish immigrants a long time ago. And of course, the Mormons love that because the Mormons believe that uh, many of the old world cultures immigrated to the United States. Okay, um, next picture. This is uh, the Turner work, sacred to Orion. And it apparently is an effigy to uh, an individual, a one-eyed man sitting uh, cross-legged and he has, uh, according to Indian legend, a deer across his shoulders, which is represented by two outlying mounds. And then behind him is laying his atlatl, or his bow. And uh, he represents the night hunter, again, in Eastern, of course, uh, um, um, astral anthologies. Uh, Orion is the hunter. So we have a, a like thing here in the West, but it's a hunter that stopped hunting and he uh, becomes surprised because his game comes to life and turns into a beautiful, unrobed woman. And he makes love with her, and they produce the first corn. And from that corn, all the foodstuffs of, of the native cultures arisen, or uh, arise, excuse me. So um, many uh, of the ancient stories having to do with the primary mythology seem to be of native people seem to be embedded in uh, many of these large structures. And this thing is like 150 acres, and it's completely destroyed. Now. I can't even find a trace of it. Okay, the next. This is a bear claw effigy, and it, it conforms uh, beautifully to the Origa constellation. 
And uh, in the next slide, uh, you can see the uh, care that was taken to pre-plan it, how they used the hexagonal configuration. And then somehow they also made it to fit the stars. So um, there's been a general disconnect uh, amongst the Ohio Valley uh, archaeologists and anthropologists as to um, were they trying to embody horizon um, uh, Audience, were they trying to just go for geometrics? Were they just trying to create animal effigies? And so archaeologists think that three or four separate groups of, of native cultures came in here over a 3,000-year period, and each one of them contributed to some of the mound structures uh, and, and left uh, their, their uh, marks in the burial grounds. Now we're starting to see that these cultures all just rehabbed these existing things and that all of these astronomical effigies are are from uh, an earlier period, all the same. Okay, next. Um, this effigy doesn't work anymore. Uh, it's no longer in existence. It's uh, the Bainbridge work. It's in the Scioto Creek River Valley. Um, and it is uh, sacred to Cassiopeia. The story that goes with it is about um, the uh, building of an effigy to a clover and that's a three-leaf clover with a ball flower. And before that, gods lived in a little paw up in the upper right district, which is a sacred to four stars. And um, that paw um, was the lodge that um, uh, entertained the great hare. And uh, the hare went there disguised as a traitor to hear what he might hear amongst these early men who were building their lodges, and when he was pleased with them, he revealed himself as the lord of the region, and he gifted them with many gifts, and after that they constructed a beautiful lodge, because he enlightened their mind through a type of smoking tobacco that cast the light of autumn into their spirits, and from that time on they were able to see into the blessed land. Okay, and the next... This is an effigy raised on another megalithic platform, probably about between 12 and 15 acres. It's destroyed now. And it's almost inaccessible, except through probably a staircase that's gone. And it apparently is an effigy to the human heart. And the story that goes with it is, is beautiful as well. It's contained in Star Mounds. Okay, the next. This is the constellation Lynx, which is also among the North constellations. And the story that goes with this has to do with five astral visitors that came. And these are the smaller works to the left of the circle and the square work. And these were like little starcraft that came in and they were inhabited by five masters. And these five masters were the five traditional masters of lust, anger, greed, infatuation, and ego. And when the five masters asked the, 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 the people who were living in this great lodge why they weren't using the five traditional masters, they said that they had no more use for them. And with that, they raised their lodge up to join the stars, and the five traditional masters had to leave because they couldn't reach their level of consciousness anymore. So each story talks about how they were transcending the ancient consciousness of mortals and of the indigenous folk into a higher knowledge of the, um, well, a colony of ethereal Atlantis. In the next uh, frame, you can see the, the unique geometric of that main lodge and how if you take the sacred cut off the square in the left-hand side, it takes you right to the edge of the circle and then again, if you take a circle and, and take a, an identical circle and move it back, it forms a Vesica Pisces. So they combine the sacred cut and the Vesica Pisces oftentimes to ensure balance. And then they would mount them into the stars. If there was any discrepancy, they would slightly change the geometric to match the stars. So they would um, show a, a, a degree of intellectual maturity in that they would create their lodges 
by strict classical geometrics to closely be with the stars and then they would model them to fit the stars after they were done. And oftentimes they fit perfectly without any changes. This one required a very slight augmentation, which is shown in star maps. Okay, next. Uh, this is the Baum work. And it's very interesting to archeologists. It's probably about um, 50 acres. And uh, each of these squares was large enough to house the Great Pyramid at Giza. And you can see how the plane of the ecliptic cuts right through the center. And the ecliptic, of course, is where the sun rises. Okay, next frame. This is Leo. And of course, it's one of the 12 great houses. And again, in the east, um, um, it was uh, you know, an effigy to a big cat. And here in the west, it was an effigy to a water panther or a lynx that had a medicine bag attached to it. And the medicine bag is perfectly divided by the clean of the ecliptic, which means that the sun rose within the medicine bag at a particular time in prehistory, when this house was probably in use. And the little feet of that effigy touch right along the plane of the ecliptic, which meant that it, that creature walked along it. And, and the native people believed that a great medicine man could transform himself into an animal as long as he kept his medicine bag intact. And all he had to do was take a pinch of his medicine, which is made from the central Manitou, distilling the energies of earth and sky into a powder or dust like the philosopher's stone and he could transform himself back into a god or a man. Okay, um, I know we're moving really quickly, but uh, that's the way it is. Uh, next slide. And this one's really interesting because the Hopeton work, which is sacred to Libra, um, had a long uh, double pathway, which is about 150 yards across, that extended slightly into Scorpius, which met where the four ancient structure in the map but not on dry land. So again, they constructed their houses of the Zodiac wherever they could find a strong electromagnetic connection with the Earth and not contiguously so that they were all just one large community accessible um, from the central. And the, the circle on this is slightly offset from the square. And so archaeologists thought that it was a, a very feeble or poor attempt at learning us astronomical alignments and trying to perfect geometrical form by these uh, people that lived just a couple of thousand years ago. In reality, they traced the lines, and it wasn't until we matched up the constellation Libra, or Libra, however you want to pronounce it, with this funny square and circle and the little circular mound above the, the, the large circle that we knew that they were sending a message that they were tracing stars and although their geometries may look awful, that wasn't that needed. Okay, the next slide. This is Taurus, and, and who knows where this is. Uh, we had a crop circle on the top of a picture on the left. Just down by that water flow, a crop circle appeared when he was visiting us. And we all thought it was because Hugh was visiting us that it happened. An actual true crop circle. It was done in corn. It was about seven feet high. And um, it had, I don't know how many smaller circles attached to it. And uh, many of us got dizzy going into it because we got there shortly after it was made. And uh, it was really quite an outing. But all the crop circles that have occurred in the Ohio Valley have been near these ancient sacred sites. And every one of those crop circles has been tested by our group here, headed by Jeffrey uh, Wilson, to be uh, true and actual crop circles, some of which were visited by the uh, United States military because they knew that they hadn't been artificially created. This particular one follows much of the constellation Scorpius. And then the two large structures in the middle of the left-hand uh, map, those seem to be sacred to um, uh, the uh, Hyades. And then the plane of the ecliptic enters into the square right through the edge of it and goes out and brushes along 
the top of that large circle as it moves its way by procession into Aries. Okay, next line. And this is the cross. And, uh, you know, I was inspired by Andrew Collins' book, uh, Cygnus, a great book. I think everybody should read it. Uh, he penetrated with a great deal of depth. Um, and it inspired us to understand um, the, um, the, the sort of uh, cross mound that uh, we have here in the Ohio Valley. It's not that large, probably about 50 yards stem to stern, but it has a stone mound going off it as, you, as Cygnus moves down to its lower part. And there's a Native American story about Skybird who um, parked himself over the Tree of Life and that he mated with a, a great uh, kind of like peahen. And their offspring were the Thunderbirds. And so the wings of Skybird, the great bird, um, reflect the same kind of mythology east and west again. Okay, next slide. Um, the great bear's head. Uh, in American Indian mythology, uh, the, great, the great head of the bear was all that the bear had because he dreamed up his body inside that head. And so much of the constellation of the great bear is located within it, as you can see. The serpent mount is located on the sky, in the sky, and his sun disk rests right on top of the bear. But originally, the bear uh, was lower than that, and you can see that in the left-hand side. And he kept a medicine satchel on his forehead filled with hornets to keep him awake so that he could remain conscious while he dreamed up his bubble. But mischief came along, released the hornets, and fell asleep and started hunting. So the master of life had to come and raise him up to a higher level so that he could wear the crown of the Gitchi, the crown of light. And he, to this day, is the guardian of the great serpent's treasure that he keeps in his lair. Okay, next slide. This is, of course, Lyra, which has uh, one of the brightest stars in the northern hemisphere in it. And although it was the largest of the earthworks, the the circle, the partial circle, is 2,800 feet across. It's really one of the smallest constellations in the sky. And this was built on the Great Miami River, which is uh, to the extreme um, west of Ohio, near the Indiana border. Okay, next. This is the uh, High Bank Complex, and it uh, probably is about 150 acres altogether. It had uh, one of the only two circle and octagon formations. And um, archaeoastronomers have found that it's isolating the circle and octagon. It has, if it uh, has the right um, uh, alignment to true north, uh, uh, a complete array of solar alignments attached to it. Okay, and the next one, we have the Newark complex, which is the uh, constellation Pisces, which is next along the plane of the ecliptic. Um, but going by procession, we're leaving um, the, the Pisces now and going into Aquarius. So you can tell how they built the little structure to the left to kind of guide the plane of the ecliptic going through it. Okay, the next. And there is how they appear in heaven. And I have a section in Star Mounds called Matches Made in Heaven. And how the two octagon and circle structures were together in heaven, while on earth they were separated over 60 miles. There are also different sizes on the earth, but in reality, their circles on the earth are the same size. Excuse me, uh, different, different sizes in heaven, but on earth they're the same size. Okay, next. And this is the geometric, when you bring both of the circle and octagons together, and you create that Arbalos of Archimedes, the one that has the, the phi ratio embedded in it, embedded in it, and, and, uh, and containing both those. Um, the um, that ratio of the phi works out in successive circles perfectly between those two. 
And that's explained in detail as star amounts for those of you that like the geometrics. Again, these are probably um, not Native American designs, but that Native American people uh, preserve them, God bless them. Uh, next slide. The Fort Hill and Fort Ancient. The Fort Hill is the Great Hare and Fort Ancient. These are the only two structures that were built exactly that way. And they were, were constructed uh, together in heaven and they are the uh, constellation Scorpius and Lupus. Okay, and the next. These are uh, four of the southern star groups. And I think these people like the northern star groups more because although they did cover most of the southern star groups in the Ohio Valley, uh, they didn't pay a lot of attention to the magnificent detail uh, um, as they did to the northern star groups. Uh, these are just four very large circular type earthworks and they follow the river Eridanos of the southern hemisphere. The next, this one's pretty stunning. They did pay a lot of attention to what we call the constellation Vela or Vela. And uh, it was very close to Cincinnati, which is where I live. And it's completely missing now. It's called the Toll Coal Rain Work. And it was probably 130 acres. And it follows with some precision the bright stars of Vela. And that's in star mounds. All these are in star mounds. This one's uh, pretty interesting because it helps me to convince a lot of uh, doubting Thomases that they did include many of the southern stars in, these, uh, in this cosmography of the Ohio Valley. This is the Wright Green Group, and it's pretty much in the southern extreme of this group in Kentucky, near Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, it, it houses the Southern Cross and Muska. And they, you can see in the upper right portion, they created two intentional extenders so that you could get the way the Southern Cross is offset, which I thought was really interesting and really kind of cute and clever. And then in the upper circle, which they made just perfect, um, they, uh, they housed the constellation Muska. And it turned out to look like the Ankh, the, uh, you know, kind of like a, uh, an Ankh-like symbol. Okay, now we're going to go on to concluding thoughts, and I know that our time is almost up. Uh, this is the plane of the ecliptic, and you can see how all 12 houses are spaced evenly. So we, we believe now that these were intentionally created to house and fill out the entire night sky, northern and southern hemispheres, without overlapping on each other. Okay, next slide. Here we get into another Atlantean theory. The, on the left is the uh, Biggs work, and it's really large, it's another 100 acre. At the center is a large Adena mound, but they recreated this, this beautiful likeness of Plato's uh, description of Atlantis. And so we think that uh, they knew what Atlantis looked like, and we believe that it was sacred to Hercules. And in those days, I believe that uh, the Atlantean god uh, it wasn't Hercules, but it was Atlas, uh, after whom Atlantis was derived, and that he held up the world, or that he was throwing a discus or something. So we have an insight into possibly Atlantean effigies. Uh, another one, the next one. This one is pretty convincing to me because I'm a, st a student of, of Greek mythology. This again is the works east, and it again is nothing but a dirt outline. And if you take it and you um, create it using uh, a sort of Atlantean garden design, it closely resembles an effigy to the goddess Athena or Athena. And you can see in the middle on the right hand picture her helmet. And this was the kind of like the brain center of this, of this uh, center. And then to her right is a pyramid. And of course the pyramid when activated uh, process the energies of earth and sky, which I have denoted by the uh, capstone crystal being lit up. And that stuff, which is called Amrita in the Indian vernacular, is pumped out by the piping system uh, throughout the complex. And in the middle, you see one design 
like a maze. And the, uh, the field that's produced surrounding this garden is so highly charged with faster than light, life-giving energy that the Manitou at the center creates a medicine that the people who work in the garden can see. And according to legend, they can walk into the astral world at the center of their garden. Then in the, in the upper left of the right-hand picture, you see a dome-like structure which has much more of that amaranth being circulated around it. And that stuff creates an environment for the people that live there so they can astral travel to distant star systems at night and uh, when they rest. So their days were very blissful and filled with hard work and communion with the Creator. And then they were able to rest at night. And when they left their bodies, they were, they were able to visit. And some say that they had vehicles they could travel to other systems with. So some people here speculate that the people from the constellations representative were able to visit their sister uh, likeness constellations here and they could do trade. The, the people here, according to native legend, actually did trade with people from other star systems when their communities were raised up to the etheric level through processing the energies of earth and sky and piping it out. Okay, next slide. Yeah. Here are two more examples. One is the constellation of Sagittarius, and um, the other one is the um, Andromeda on the right. And these are two more examples of possible garden structures. And I believe all of the houses of the zodiac had used antitudes and were able to process the energies of earth and sky but that the serpent central Manitou was the most powerful and strong of them all, and that the crystal, which the, which the uh, Cherokee people called the Ulanya Sut, that crystal was created having many shards, and that those shards were given to each of these pyramidal complexes and their Manitous in order to have sort of a frequency exchange they kept the whole complex over hundreds of square miles attuned to the great serpent. And, and so when, if the lights went out temporarily here, they could keep things active by sending energy from the central Manitou. But generally speaking, all of these houses were, had their own power sources because they were built on hillocks over in rivers where energy is trapped. And Michelle talks about that too. He says, you know, where there's a water flow, a lot of earth energies can be collected and concentrated. So on the right-hand picture, you see another garden, large, um, the large uh, circle. And it was composed of many, many small mounds. And this is an Iroquoian way of gardening. And that each one of these mounds grew a different herb or whatever. And they processed many of these things in the center of their gardens. like. According to a platonic legend, uh, these people grew many different herbs and created essential oils, which they knew how to distill and separate into their chemical constituents, and they could create wonderful medicines with them. And then they did their interplanetary or, or inter, inter-site exchanges in the, um, in the dome structure in the upper right. And then again, you have your obligatory pyramid and again, each of their pyramids were as large or nearly as large as the Great Pyramid. And then the smaller circle was the processing, the pumping area, so they could keep the energies, the fluid, the faster than light fluid flowing. And then in the right, uh, the larger circle, you have a beaver manatee all lit up, and you have a pond-like scheme or a bog scheme where they may have grown plants that needed a lot of water. and. Uh, that, that, that pretty much uh, concludes what I had to say, Hugh. Do you want to add anything? Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> any, any questions? We're all good here. <laughs> I know what you mean. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a little early for me. Oh, there you go. You're, you're on the screen again now. So, uh, you know, okay. wave, wave to the audience. 
Well, thank you very much, Ross. Really appreciate your time coming over early in the morning from Ohio. All right. Thanks.